Hello everyone, welcome back to Just Another Air Phone Podcast here on the Apex Motorsport. My name is Richard Smith and we just had the historic Monaco Grand Prix. And joining me today to discuss it all is of course Ryan. Ryan, welcome back to the podcast and let's start with your free word race review. Right, let's see if I can muster up some words here. Um, unpredictable. Somehow it was exciting, and we'll add, oh, that's a big word and I don't even know what it means. I was going to say exonerating, but I don't know what that means. Do you know what that means? Um, don't have the definition on top of my head, to be fair. Well, maybe that word. I just think it sounds like a big proper word. Okay. It sounds important. If not, yeah, well, we'll just go with uh, wet. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll stick with that. But your second word, excitement, something that isn't usually linked closely with Monaco, but this weekend was slightly different. And we're going to start with that, Brian. Um, this felt very much a different Monaco Grand Prix than we have in the past. I think everyone's expectations going into the weekend was Saturday's the main day of the race, um, Sunday's just the parade lap. But it felt a little bit different because you had that idea of Charles Leclerc, obviously, has had a lot of bad luck around Monaco but he had there was a little bit of hope that this might be his year to win the race um obviously it wasn't the case but he done the job on Saturday and to be fair he should have probably won on Sunday because of where he started on Saturday but it wasn't to be but Ryan do you think this was a different Monaco Grand Prix do you think it was maybe overhyped or do you think it it lived up to the expectations that were slightly higher than what's been previously for your last point, most definitely. Uh, we've had some awful races, what, the last three years? Like, obviously, excluding 20, wo- 2020, uh, 2020. It's hard to remember which year it actually was that we did that many races. Um, but no, apart from that year, the Monaco Grand Prix sort of been dull, depressing, boring, snooze fest. I'm trying to think of other words for being tired, but yeah, it's it's not exactly one that you would keep your attention towards in case something happens. Like obviously things do happen around Monaco. It is Monaco. It's tight. It's narrow, but with that, there's no overtaking. There's well, you can overtake if you're very, 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 very lucky that someone makes a mistake as you're coming around one of the corners where you can pass, but it's very unlikely because everyone's sort of being on their best behaviour because. Well, nobody wants to end up in the wall. <coughs> Max Schumacher, <coughs> sorry. Um, but no, <laughs> it's definitely, I think this year they've sort of half salvaged it. But the actual Monaco Grand Prix team didn't solve that. Mother Nature took care of it. They provided us with a wet race, something more interesting. Of course, strategy is usually where the Monaco Grand Prix is won and lost, which we also seen, as well as having a, having a wet race, drivers deciding which tires they want to go on to instead of the team with the information deciding and to be fair it did live up to having a you know a really good race uh, obviously is that historical value which you said but history can only go so far per hockenheim's gone well we'll not even talk about the the r-u-s-s-i-a-n grand prix because well it's gone um I probably didn't even spell that right, I'm talking too fast. (laughs) But historic value, it's been there pretty much since the start, as far as I can recall. So, to not have the Monaco Grand Prix, it does have that historic knock-on where it's like, you need it. It's sort of been there, it's always been there. You need it. And my favourite bit, the swimming pool, just because it's super fast, super fun, and uh, people go into the wall. Max Schumacher, (coughs) again. (coughs) No. Yeah, I think. Yeah, Monaco is one of them tracks that it's just Formula One. That you, know, I, I've been there at Monaco when it's been away from the Formula One season, and there's been. It, it's been. It's, it's a weird experience. I don't really know how to sum it up because all the curbs are still painted. You know the track layout. You you're walking effectively on the track because of how narrow it is and you can see why these cars struggle so much to overtake because it's difficult enough to get two cars you know, side by side in the same road, never mind these massively wide Formula 1 cars that you know need 
as much room as they can to especially get around that hairpin but it's one of them circuits that I feel like it needs to be on the calendar even if it is just the 77 lap parade because I feel like especially with the calendar being 20 plus races I think 22 this year that's expected to go up and rise for the next few seasons one weekend where Formula 1 gets to live in the, the glory of and the glamour of Monaco for purely historic reasons I think I feel like fans should, should allow that because you, you're not going to have 25 amazing races in a season if you get 10 absolute classics in a season I think you're going to be very lucky so you need tracks like Monaco, like Silverstone, like Monza, like Spa to be part of this and you know nearly potentially it's about something they've had on like the F1 games create a trophy for the driver of these historic tracks of do the best have a mini championship to add just an extra meaning to these and especially with the Indy 500 being on the same the same weekend you have Monaco in the afternoon in the car in the evening in the UK and it's just it's one of them days where motorsport just it's like, it's like the big a big cup final in football terms for Monaco. The the, the Sunday of the Grand Prix and then the 500 is Motorsports Day to really just show, well, this is what we can bring to the world in terms of a massive event, especially when you've got the likes of the Champions League final the same weekend. It, it's a mad weekend for sport, and I was at Donington Park, obviously, for the British GT, GB3 and GB4, and... I didn't really get to enjoy watching the Monaco Grand Prix as much as I would have if I was home because I was trying to follow it while also covering various different races and the red flag period, Ryan, I don't know if you agree with me, was probably one of the most exciting parts of the the entire weekend purely for the fact that there was so much confusion from purely from a spectator point of view there was so much confusion, there was so much going on that we wanted to get racing but it was also, there was this drama filled episode which because we still had the expectation of this is going to be a slightly boring race and the track was drying up that it might not have been as fun as we're sort of hoping do you think Ryan that the red flag added helped add a little bit of tension and I think inevitably when racing got underway made it that little bit better yeah at the start it was uh, I think it was a bit over drawn i think they, they they waited too long after the rain yes you could well this is the first the first sort of part of the race i suppose before the race even started uh you know the, the wet rather they waited for it instead of letting the cars go for maybe a couple of laps and then call it off would have added a couple of extra laps just in case because imagine we didn't get the 75 percent race distance and then it was half points again for a wet race, that oh, the championship would have just went up in flames. Yeah. Awful. But no, I think they should have let them out for a few laps, seen how the rain was going to come in. Obviously, they did, in some sense, make a good decision because if the rain did come down heavy and they didn't then decide quick enough to bring everyone in to cancel it, to stop the race, then we could have seen a couple more cars in the barrier, a couple more people out of the race. We only seen two cars out of the race. Uh, both houses, unfortunately, even though they were, they weren't exactly in points positions really anyway. But you know, it would have been still an extra two cars in the the, the very crammed, packed Monaco street circuit, uh, if you'd even call it a street, just a small narrow road <laughs> <laughs> with two lanes, and two lanes isn't wide enough for two Formula One cars yeah. to pass, which makes it very yeah. boring. Uh, but the red flag of Mick Schumacher helped uh, sort of also break things up because everyone was like, oh, well, that just happened. Right, um, everyone in, let's sort our tires out. Fix everything we need to fix. Hamilton, we'll fix your front wing because, you know, Esteban, bing bong, uh, hit his front wing. Uh, well, 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 apparently you've got to leave the space, you know, for Mando, you know, you've got to leave the space as, as far as he knows. You've got to leave the space. I'm, I'm going to keep repeating that. You've got to leave the space. <laughs> No. Um, oh, my head's went funny. What am I trying to think of here? Ah, yes. Red flags, that's what we're talking about. My head's like clockwork here. It goes tick, 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 and I forget what I'm talking about. Uh, but no, the second red flag uh, sort of broke everything up, sort of grabbed your attention again. 
even though we were sort of half actually watching the race for once because it was wet, waiting to see if anyone was going to make a mistake. Obviously, we got that red flag. Uh, it took f nearly 15 minutes for them to 15 20 minutes nearly for them to fix a barrier and clean up debris and then get the race underway again. We had a good start, pretty well, but I do think that you know having that red flag it helped break things up. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, it, it was a better race than we've had previously. Um, obviously it's not on the calendar next season as it stands. There's been no contract signed, but I think this year may have gone a little way of helping that in terms of a lot of fans were on board with how exciting it was compared to normal and there is the whole historical debate which we've had today and we've had many other times as well that it's it needs to be on the calendar but in what capacity I think that's something that needs needs to discuss down the line because it is historic and it'd be a shame to see it be dropped especially if you're going to replace it with just an old street circuit somewhere else where the same problems will occur but Ryan, this was really a weekend for the number two drivers. Um, we've seen Perez and Sainz really perform well. Perez especially, obviously taking that race victory. Um, do you think this was really his way of laying down a championship or a title challenge? Because he's only a handful of points off Leclerc and he's within touching distance of Verstappen now. Yeah, he's, he's put himself in essentially the champion's fight or the... The battle for the championship, the drivers' championship. He's he's now only fifteen off Max Verstappen, so that's less than a race win. That's like you can even even if he finishes second, Max DNFs, the uh, Leclerc DNFs, he's on top. He'll be the first Mexican to lead a world drivers' championship. <laughs> Unreal. Um, but no, I think even but almost. Yeah, actually, the the number two drivers nearly in every team well apart from McLaren and Aston Martin and well it depends what way you want to view Aston Martin yeah. is, is Seb the number mm -hmm. one or is Lance the number one because you know daddy mm -hmm. owns the team but no we've That's seen George Russell outperform out Lewis Hamilton we've seen Checo outperform Max for the first time in a long time we've also seen Sainz outperform Leclerc although partially due to very 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 poor clownery once again of a strategy uh, we're bringing back the Mattia, the clowns again. It seems, as I've seen on Twitter, <laughs> the clowns are back in town. <laughs> but no, um, yeah, the number two drivers seem to do quite well across the board. Uh, Mick um, sort of half outperformed Magnussen. If you call class DNFing because of you know mechanical issues instead of putting it on the wall counts maybe. Um, Gasly, well, to be fair, Yuki, he did put in a solid performance. Pierre was on fire, uh, no, without a doubt, when he got on those uh, enters. He just put the foot down, had far better grip from the full, people on the full wet still. He was still squir you know, squirming about, and I was like, what's going on here? They're on full wet, squirming about. He's on enters, having a wee bit of a squirm, but flying. Doesn't make sense. Made like three overtakes or something. Crazy. Imagine overtaking a Monaco. <laughs> Couldn't be <laughs> anyone else. <laughs> but yeah, the number two's had a pretty solid weekend, I feel. So driving you mentioned there um, in the last part you were talking about was George Russell out before Lewis Hamilton. He's obviously continuing his, his streak of finishing the top five of every race this season, which so far includes two podiums as well, which is brilliant given the car he's in. He's struggling, you know, again, he's struggling in Mercedes. He's not even getting in the podium with Mercedes for most of the races. That is bizarre compared to last season, but... This is the reality of the regulation changes and this is what we have to deal with this season and what Russell and Hamilton have to deal with and Russell seems to be managing it the better of the two. But Ryan, just talk to me about Russell's sort of weekend in general, the race. He he, he looked strong, he didn't really get as much airtime as he probably should but he was comfortable, he'd done a job and he's he's doing really well given the car he's got, especially when it was a roller coaster around Monaco. Well, considering... And I might be wrong here because they may have changed it in the last year, uh, but I highly doubt it. Uh, the F1 TV production is outcast to a third party, so the TV Monaco, direction is yes. usually awful around Monaco. Is that still the mm -hmm. case? 
Yes, around Monaco. Yes. yes. So hence why the cuts are very snappy and not smooth like we're used to seeing. It's just like corner, 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 switch to a different car, different team. Here we go. Oh, someone's on a fast lap. Overtake? Nah, forget about that. Oh, wait. Oh, they did overtake? Oh, let's replay that instead of showing yeah. it the first time. Uh, yeah. And then the Lance Stroll graphic. Yeah. Oh, no. We need to know what's happening. <laughs> oh, iconic. And sure, then Lance hit the wall as well at one point. Silly man. He's not very good at keeping things out of walls or making mistakes. Come on, Lance. Like, I know your dad owns a team, but you're decent in the wet. Come on, what's going on here? Come on, come on, come on. Now I forgot. Yes, Russell. <laughs> Completely forgot the question. George Russell. He is flying in that Mercedes. For a car that you would imagine the one and only hashtag blessed, uh, sorry, Will, uh, <laughs> could, you know, drive. He's taken that car and made it his own. He's really... He's really sort of at the minute upstage in Hamilton, which nobody really expected that to happen as quick as how it has. Like we knew George was going to be good, you know. At Williams, we've seen him. He's, he was quick. He was he was learning how to defend properly, which we've seen in Spain you know, down that main straight. The defense on him was a wee bit touch and go, but inevitably really strong. He's just learning these things as he was going along. Then he got his chance, obviously, and. Bahrain Secure Grand Prix am I correct I think yes yeah to win yes yes and he, he he genuinely could have won that race but that was the first time he was in the Mercedes and basically hats down he was there to replace Hamilton and he did just that he replaced Hamilton and I think now Hamilton is technically the second driver <laughs> well the thing I find funny with that is this I think it's purely for colour scheme continuity with Hamilton running this bright yellow for le- for less than yellow he has the the camera on top of the car hits the yellow which is usually the one that's used for second drivers so I don't know where that's coming from because conspiracy theories so, sometimes teams like to use it as they go by driver numbers which makes sense but Hamilton's the first driver in terms of driver numbers as well so I don't know is it a kind of George always uses the one side of the garage or it's purely down to the colour scheme which would make sense but it's just a little bit interesting something that you know I don't think it's really been picked up on it could mean absolutely nothing but something maybe keep an eye on if Mercedes mainly next season come with a championship winning car what sort of team orders are put in place is something to to keep in the back of your mind and if there is some sort of theory down the line I want to be the first to claim that because I said it on the podcast so I'm claiming to that but yeah Ryan um, do you think George is definitely justifying the reason why he's in Mercedes Mercedes have made a good choice oh yeah 100% in terms of Mercedes I don't even think like as much as it pains me to say this I don't even think Bottas could have done that this you know this weekend or last weekend, or whatever way you want to call it, it is Monday. Uh, but I, I don't even think Bottas could have handled that. Obviously, he's got rally experience, wet weather, snow, everything to him. He could have handled that just as well as Hamilton. But if Hamilton's struggling, struggling to adapt, think of how bad, you know, Bottas would have struggled to adapt as well. Who also has struggled anyway. But because George didn't really drive the previous season's cars you know with the small changes and then going to a big change he's went from a Williams to a Mercedes which is a big change of its own so he's just fully readapting instead of doing minor adaptions so he's just settled in with that car amazingly so I think to be fair to George he has earned that seat six seven races in he has earned that seat hands down Bottas didn't have a best race either he did probably do as best as he could for the Alfa Romeo but he seems to be quite consistent getting up in the points uh, P8 is roughly where he finishes between P6 P8 so he's, he's doing alright you know he you know he passed George a few times so I'm sure he's definitely looked the other direction and said his little famous words uh, while going past but <laughs> No, uh, just just to basically round it up again. George, you're in the good seat. Stay there. And very quickly on this one, Ryan, there was comments made by Zach Brown that Daniel Ricciardo hasn't lived up to expectations at McLaren. 
Do you agree with that? Do you think that potentially McLaren might be looking elsewhere because although Ricardo is is near time race winner, he's a very experienced driver and has had some major success. He just hasn't been at the level at McLaren that he should really be at. Maybe they should uh, instead of just completely getting rid of Ricardo. Uh, how about they do a fifty fifty split of the season? You know, one race and then he takes the third race and then the fifth race, and then the guy that does the second race, the fourth race, uh, will be uh, Pat Award <laughs> for the <laughs> second at the weekend. Yeah, when the events don't clash. Uh, well, yeah, when the events don't clash, but I think that would be, that'd be interesting, you know, him, him to actually give him something to fight for instead of, you know, just being like, oh, sorry, guys. And then with the biggest smile on his face. Yeah. Oh, poor Daniel. Yeah. He's trying to smile through the, the bad times, but he just needs he just needs a bit more positivity from outside himself to actually, you know, give him that boost. He hasn't had that boost. It's all, you know, Zach Brown, get in there, Lando. You know, you don't ever hear... Great job, Daniel. You don't really hear that much anymore. You did once, and that was Emma mm. when he won. But yeah. that was essentially handed to him because they told they told that Lando don't pass Ricardo. So you know, it is what it is. But hopefully, we see him pick it up. I know I said that all last season, and it it did happen a wee bit towards the middle of the season, just after the. Summer break, uh, not the, well, winter break. So no, I uh, summer break because the winter break's a new season. The summer break, so well, late middle summer, late summer break, whatever way you wanna call it. But no, he did sort of pick up form then. So if he doesn't pick up the form before then, but he does after, he could be uh, watching out. That seat could very quickly disappear. Yeah, and I'll just have to correct you. It was uh, Monza he won and not Imola, but I think he's going to good effort trying to. Yeah, Italian, <laughs> yeah. Italian track. Yeah, um, good effort there, Ryan. Um, My memory's not yet, yeah. remember. <laughs> but on Pat Award, obviously, in the 500, massive shout out to Marcus Ericsson for winning that. That was I think incredible. Ericsson hit us. Yeah, I think he's having a great time over in the car, and i seen a tweet, and I did find it quite funny, that uh, Marcus Ericsson wasn't the 2018 Cyber Driver we expected to win a historic race this weekend. Obviously, the only one being Charles Leclerc. So, it would have been a great weekend if the 2018 Cyber Duo could have done the double, but Marcus Ericsson is an Indy 500 winner, which is quite incredible. Um, and it's great to see, and so many former Formula 1 drivers going out there and not coming over there and taking over the sport, but justifying how good of a driver they were to be in Formula 1 in the first place, win their in equal cars, and bring the fight to some of the most experienced drivers, like your Scott Dixon, your Joseph Newgardens, but also the young drivers like Powder Ward, like Colton Herta. It's great to see. But Ryan, let's move on to some predictions One now. Second. And I just thought of the greatest pun you could stick in there. Right? He he went from Formula One onto greater pastures. He drank the milk at the end of the one. <laughs> uh, oh, that was stuck in my head. I was waiting for you to shut up. So I <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, predictions time, Ryan. Course. Yeah, and this is why you're on the podcast <laughs> for moments like that. Silly. This is why everyone's been waiting twenty odd minutes for. Is to hear you come away with comments like that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Everyone's still here. Yeah. Hello, if you're still here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> never change, or I never change. Um, obviously, predictions to last race. I had a good bit of success. I obviously you predicted... good bit of success? To... You, you smashed it out the park? <laughs> yeah, second time of the season, I've got the top three correct. Not in the right order this time, although Perez, race winner, and then I had Verstappen and... Signs in the podium, but in that order, not signs for stopping as it was in reality. Um, so I got three points, I was quite happy. Ryan, you got I think it was you got what you got two points, I can't remember exactly. I was think it was for podiums as well. Yeah, it was who was one was signs on the podium, not signs. Ah, right, signs. No, it was for stopping on yeah. the podium, it wasn't even signs because I said yeah. for stopping and. Because I thought Leclerc was going to win. Oh, it was uh, pole position. I said Leclerc on pole. Mm, yes, it was, yes. It was Leclerc on pole and then Verstappen yes. on the podium. 
Dang mm. it. <laughs> yeah, so I have a 15 10 lead uh, going into the next race, but Ryan, uh, who are you going to put on pole position? Azerbaijan. Usually that's a Mercedes track because it's, you know, straight line speed. But, but. At the minute, straight line speed seems to be going more favourable Red Bull. My analogies haven't been working out for me. <laughs> One minute I'm it's like, well, going well, it is a more straight line speed track. Right for I have just taken pole. What happened? Come on. Right, I'm going to believe in it. I think Max will be back on form. It's going Max Verstappen, pole position. Okay. Um, I'm going to go Perez. I think he's in the form of his, li form of his life right now. Oh, he's so on point. Um, who's going to be your race winner? Red Bull's really good with strategy. If they have consistent straight line speed, here I go again. It's, you know, three big fast parts of the track, essentially. Well, actually, there's quite a lot. As long as the two Red Bulls don't do what they did with, you know, Daniel and Max 2016, I think it was where they sort of uh, rammed into one another going into a corner and obviously Christian Horner did not look too impressed. He doesn't look like that he's aged any more than that so he, he must be Tom Cruise because Tom Cruise doesn't seem to age. Back to the point, I think it's going to stay with Max. Okay. Um, I would it not was put a tenor as well on for the crash. sky anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it was 2018 the crash happened. Dang it. So. I'm off yeah. Again. Yeah. Good. Good job. This isn't the um, end of your quiz video because oh, well, I was awful in that don't... anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm... In 20... What happened in 2016 then? Um, Is that when Daniel and... joined? Um, it was when Verstappen made his debut for oh, Red Bull. Wait, that's what it was. Yeah. Um, the biggest crash that season was obviously Hamilton and Rosberg in Spain, which we talked about last time. Yeah, where well, they just uh, um, went onto the grass, tried to get past, bang, mm -hmm. spawn, bang. Yeah, I'm going to say, from a race winner, uh, Carlos Sainz, I'm going to say Sergio, no Sergio Sainz, but it's Carlos Sainz, I think he's got a point to prove, and yeah, um, I can't have luck both weeks, so I fully expect him to be run this week. Ryan, who's joining Max on the podium? Hmm. So I want to hedge bets on a outside driver, but I don't think anyone else might have the straight line speeds that they would need to do that. However, there is a couple of wee tight corners as long as nobody crashes, and I call it the castle. We've seen I am stupid crash there before, so I I I, w I don't want to put him on the podium. <laughs> <laughs> because you know I am stupid as stupid sometimes and could just but don't but I can also see Mick I can also see Latifi I can also see Joe uh, all crashing into there so I think everyone knows what corner I'm on about mm -hmm. I call it the castle just because yeah. I think it looks a bit like a castle but sure uh, I think it is a castle oh well that's probably why I think it looks like that <laughs> um We'll stick Perez in there. Okay. Definitely. He's de he's going to be there maybe second or third. It, it, you know, it could be any of the two. Mm-hmm. I'm annoyed here. Right. The clowns will deliver the Claire. Okay. Um, fastest lap, I'm obviously sticking with my usual uh, Lando Norris. Does it will happen for this race? No, he got it in Monaco. Did he? Yes. Oh, that's why you got it at so many points. <laughs> oh, I haven't even added that to my points tally. Oh. <laughs> I did not. I did not know that. Someone can't read a a word document properly. I was sitting looking through them when I I was like it was like probably lap 50 at this point or whatever it was based on time and I was like I wonder what the predictions were well, again I've forgotten because this is a wet race and we didn't predict for a wet race and I looked in and I was no. like no way no way how is this happening how has this happened I mean in fairness I was trying to report in the British GT three hour race at Downton Park so I was slightly distracted throughout it 
Yeah, Lando Norris, he got the, he got the fastest lap because they were talking about it at the end. He said because he said cool. whether even if he gained another position, he would have only gained another point. Okay, Ryan. So now we know that Lando Norris got the fastest lap in Monaco. I'm going to predict him for the fastest lap here too. And who are you going to say is going to get the fastest lap? Max Verstappen. Short, sweet, and simple. Okay. How many safety cars do you reckon? I reckon two. Okay, I'm going to go three. And uh, random generator time? Yeah, I have it ready to uh, go. I was okay. ready. So what? Uh, give me a number between one and 100, please. So I click it once, click it twice, click it three times, and we get our number. Number two. So that's... The closest would be Daniel Ricciardo at number three. It would be. So... I think Stoffel van Dorn isn't competing, so I'm going to go Daniel Ricciardo, DNF. I think, do you think that's fair? Yeah, that's fair. That's okay, fair. and your number? Click it once, click it twice, click it three times, and it didn't do it. Ah, oh, there, 13. Who's close to 13? Past him. Alonso, four, Fernando Alonso, Alonso. 14. Okay. Oh, hold on, what did I uh, say it was? Oh. You said it was 13, so 14. 13, yeah, 14. If it was th if it was 12, I could have got Perez. Fernando Alonso. Fernando Alonso. Top 5? Is that fair? Okay. It would be good for my fantasy team, to be fair. Um, it would be good, for, um, well, it'd be good for mine, too, I think. Yeah. Um, so, Ryan, any final thoughts before I round out this podcast? Um, I'm hoping this time it is a uh, uh, go Joe go like I said, uh, the first time I realised I said, Joe no go which did happen, he did not finish the race, and then I said Joe go Joe, he did finish this race so I'm going to say Joe go Joe again and hope that he finishes this race as well. Okay, so yeah um, that's going to bring the end to today's podcast, thank you to everyone for watching listening or whatever platform you're getting this on and we hope you can join us next time for the Azerbaijan Grand Prix Goodbye <laughs>